Misha here. If you enjoy our episodes on career pathways in healthcare or the STEM field at large, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, the same team behind the acclaimed A16Z podcast. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with venture capital investors and A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. So whether you're interested in building a new digital healthcare company or your company is advancing a new novel medicine, Raising Health sheds light on some of the opportunities and obstacles along the founder's journey. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights, actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in citro CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. A science story, huh? And I just thought, well, I figured it, out. Wow. I it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. As a reminder, we have events coming up in Portland, Oregon, Portland, Maine, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and New York City. Go to storycollider.org for more info. This week's story is from Jessica Henkel. It was recorded in April 2015 at the Koshland Science Museum in Washington, D.C., as part of a special event showcasing the Christine Mirzan Science and Technology Policy Fellows. So I had been told that the key to any PhD was simple perseverance. And I knew perseverance. I had learned perseverance during my master's research, investigating the microsatellite, investigating the population genetics of endangered sandhill cranes, when plate run after plate run failed to successfully amplify the limited amount of DNA I had from these critically endangered birds. And I had learned perseverance when my dissertation research plan was completely upended by the largest oil spill in American history. But my belief in my own fortitude was thoroughly tested one day back in November of 2010 on a remote beach in coastal Louisiana. So on the southwestern edge of Louisiana, there is the parish of Cameron. And the communities of Cameron Parish were once referred to as the Cajun Riviera due to its miles and miles of relatively sandy coastline and Cajuns. <laughs> However, the hurricanes of 2005, Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, completely decimated the area. And when Hurricane Ike came through three years later with a 60-mile storm surge, the communities were essentially destroyed. While a 60-mile storm surge might destroy a coastal community, it doesn't necessarily destroy a coastal ecosystem. And this area was still relatively popular with migratory shorebirds, which I study. So it's into this landscape that I head out long before dawn on one November morning with my partner at the time, Tom, my dog, Norris, and a brand new university field truck to trap and ban migratory shorebirds in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And when we head out, the tide is really low, and we end up having to drive about five and a half miles down the beach before we find an area that's suitable for me to set up my nets to trap and ban the birds. But we do so, and several hours later, we have trapped, banned, and sampled six shorebirds, which is not a terrible morning in the world of shorebird ecology. <laughs> and uh, we are about to, we're about to head in for lunch and head, head back out during dusk. And also, the tide's starting to come in. And I joked to Tom that, hey, we better get off this beach before it washes us away. It's about at that moment that I reach for my university truck keys that had been lanyard to my waders and felt nothing but air. Now, you know that moment when you start to feel panic slowly creeping up from your toes and you tell yourself, no, 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 stay calm, you've got this, don't panic. This is going to be okay. You're going to laugh about this later over a beer. Well, I tried to hold on to that feeling. I said, don't panic. I'm sure you put those keys down next to your banding box. Don't panic. I'm sure you put them in the truck for some reason. 
Don't panic, I'm sure they are here somewhere. Well, two hours later, with our necks sunburnt from pacing back and forth, shuffling our feet through the sand between the truck and my nets, which were now standing in two feet of water, it was time to start panicking. Reluctantly, I call my new PhD advisor. <laughs> and I explain to her the situation, the truck plus key situation, not so much the truck plus keys plus water situation. And hey, it's OK. There is another set of truck keys. But they're at the university in New Orleans, five and a half hours away. But hey, it's OK. I have this amazing friend by the name of Preston Dauphin who is willing to go pick those keys up from my advisor and drive them all the way out to me, um, out to me on the beach in Cameron Parish. He had actually bought a truck the night before, and he was really excited about going on this little road trip and taking it off-road for the first time. So perseverance, right? There are worse things than hanging out on a beach for the day, except there's that water. So tides in Louisiana are a funny thing. Uh, on the northern Gulf of Mexico, there's no bedrock because it was formed from sediment runoff from the Mississippi, which means that tides are incredibly wind-driven in the area. And just as a really strong wind from the north will wash out all the water out of the back bays, a really strong wind from the south will completely submerge a coastal beach. Just my luck. On this particular beautiful November day, not only were we going to experience full moon tides, but the winds were predicted to pick up from the south and get very strong. So I don't know a whole lot about cars, but I do live in the below sea level city of New Orleans. And I know that cars, engines, plus water are not a good thing. And I figured that car engines plus water when that engine belonged to the brand new university truck vehicle that you had planned to use for the next four years of field research, that was probably a really not a good thing. So I knew I either had to get that truck off the beach or up as high on that beach as possible. In efforts to try to get the truck off the beach, I learned a couple of things. I learned uh, that the local fire department had lost all their off-roading vehicles in the hurricanes and hadn't had them replaced. I learned that the closest wildlife refuge didn't pick up the phone on Saturdays. And I learned that AAA has a great sense of humor. <laughs> but they weren't going to rescue me off that beach. <laughs> so we were, we were looking around the beach trying to figure out what we should do. We just have to get that truck up the beach as high as possible. And we're trying to decide how high up this beach do we need to get it. To give you an idea of what these beaches look like at the time, the exit for this particular field site, I always marked by knowing that it wasn't the first rusted out refrigerator on the left, but the third. And if I passed the washing machine, I'd gone too far and I needed to turn back around. So where we were, there was no rusted out appliances, but there were these gourds, all these really small gourds that must have fallen off a shipping tanker. And looking around, I said, okay, that must mark the last high tide event where those gourds are sitting on the beach and we decide we have to get the truck above gourd line. <laughs> Two more things that are important. Anyone who's ever locked themselves out of a truck or a vehicle knows that if you try to turn a steering wheel without the keys in it, the steering wheel locks up. And anyone who's ever gone off-roading knows that you're always supposed to keep your tires as straight as possible, because that's how you don't get stuck in the mud or in the sand. So I've got a truck parked parallel, parallel to the incoming tide and when I turn it, I can get that steering wheel about five degrees until it locks up. So we've got a truck at five degree angle and 15 feet to get that truck up the beach. For the next three and a half hours, Tom and I get an incredible workout. <laughs> As he leans his back up against the grill of the truck and I run around and release the emergency brake and then run around to the front and we push, 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 push until the sand gives out from underneath us and then he holds the truck there and I run back around and pull the emergency brake and then we relax. All the while, with Norris the dog looking on encouragingly. <laughs> but three and a half hours later, we, we've done it. We are sunburnt, because I should mention, I am pale, and Tom is a redhead, and we were very sunburnt at this point, and our feet are very blistered, because I've taken off my waders, but we're still wearing mud boots. 
but the truck is above the high gourd line. It's going to be okay. We're going to make it through this high tide. And Preston will be there soon, and we can just relax. And we'll, we'll get water, and we'll get food, and Norris, the dog, will be happy again. And then Preston calls. And sheepishly, he says, so you know how I bought this truck yesterday? I could have sworn it had four-wheel drive. It didn't. And so we try with the limited amount of cell phone service that we're getting to find anyone else that's willing to drive on the beach, but we can't find anyone. And confident that the truck is above gourd line, we decide to pack it up, pack up Norris the dog, and walk the five and a half miles down the beach and meet Preston at the beach entrance, which we do. And by the time we meet him, the sun is set, and the wind, by the way, is still picking up from the south. And we trade Norris the dog for some water and some truck keys. And we start our trek back to the truck. Because while it was dark, there was a full moon. <laughs> and there was this nice breeze coming in from the south. <laughs> so it was just going to be another five and a half stroll down the beach. And there was no way I was going to leave that truck out there overnight when the next high tide would be coming soon. So about three and a half miles down the beach, uh, there is, was this little uh, a barbed wire fence that was half submerged in the sand and, and trolling out into the water. And I noticed it on our first two passes down the beach because it kind of marked the halfway point. It was about three and a half miles down. And trying to keep spirits light, I remarked to Tom, hey, look, we're more than halfway there. Well, it's about then that I look off in the distance and I see something sleeping on the shore. Some things, rather, several very large some things. Now, when I had called the local wildlife biologist, he had told me, uh, you know, to look for the birds, you just drive in onto the beach at the access points and you drive until you find the birds. Oh, and watch out for the cattle. So I'm from New York originally. And my dad lives in upstate New York, and I've always known New York dairy cattle. Docile New York dairy cattle. And so, as we were trying to pass the cattle, giving them as much space as possible, and they stand up and start to form a line across the beach, I say to Tom, oh look, they must be forming a line to head back into the wetlands where they must have come from. <laughs> These were not New York dairy cattle. <laughs> These were Texas Longhorn cattle. These were Texas Longhorn cattle that had been left to become relatively feral following the hurricanes that had devastated the area when ranchers were unable to get back to the area for months, if not years at a time, and the fences had been washed away by a 60-foot storm surge. And they were not forming a line to head back into the wetlands. <laughs> These cattle formed a line across the beach and started walking towards us quickly. Uh, the one thing I did know about cattle was that you're never supposed to run from them. So we start walking backwards as quickly as possible. <laughs> but soon enough, that is not fast enough, and we literally turn around and run for our lives. <sighs> Several hundred feet away, we pass that little barbed wire fence, and thank goodness for that barbed wire fence that was submerged in the sand, because although it would not have held back Norris the dog, the cattle recognized it as some sort of barrier and stopped at it. We were only about 15 feet away from it, from them. So we were safe and we were alive. But my truck <laughs> was on the other side of the cattle. And the cattle made it very clear that they were not going to let us pass. So defeated, we walked the three and a half miles back down the beach to the beach entrance. As the winds continue to blow, and I'm literally watching the beach cascade away as we walk there. Once we get there and we get back to the trailer that we had rented for the weekend and back within cell phone service and, and, and charged phones, we finally actually get in touch with the friends that we tried to call. In the first place, our friends Rose and Brian, because we knew Brian had a Jeep that he loved to take off-roading. And we tried to call him the day before, but we hadn't been able to get through. And then we got in touch with Preston and thought everything was cool. Uh, 
we get in touch with Rose and Brian, but it's Saturday night now, around 10 o'clock at night, and it's Rose and Brian's anniversary, and they pick up the phone and they say, hey, what are you guys doing? You want to come hang out? <laughs> I explained to them the situation, and of course, they are more than willing to drive and come rescue us. They are in New Orleans, by the way, but they need to take a little nap because they've had some wine. <laughs> but as soon as they can, they will get on the road and they will drive and rescue, bring, bring us back to what is ever left of that truck the next morning. So I spend the next nine hours pacing in that trailer, convinced that the truck has now been lost to the Gulf of Mexico and that I will forever be that grad student <laughs> that lost the truck to the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> but finally they arrive and we drive out on the beach, which is about a quarter the size that it was the day before when the whole adventure had first began. And we pass that barbed wire fence and there are hundreds of cow patties but no cattle. But a little further down the beach, there are gourds. There are the high tide gourds. They were a little higher up the beach now, about five feet, but they were there, and the truck was there. And the water had risen right up to the top of the tires, but not above. And I put my keys in the truck engine, and I turned it on, and it ran. <laughs> and we successfully drove off the beach. And 30 hours after the whole ordeal began, I had learned a lot of things. <laughs> I had learned about the strength of wind-blown tides. I had learned that I have the most amazing friends who are willing to drive hours upon hours and walk miles upon miles to help me out. That you should not take warnings about feral Texas Longhorn cattle lightly. And I learned that a PhD is indeed about perseverance, if not a little bit of self-preservation. <laughs> but most importantly, I learned that even if you have absolutely no plans whatsoever to be anywhere near water, always keep afloat on your keychains. <laughs> That was Jessica Henkel. Jessica is a Christine Merzan Science and Technology Policy Fellow with the National Academy of Sciences and a PhD candidate in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Tulane University. Jessica is interested in how environmental and anthropogenic change and habitat degradation are impacting the coastal habitats of the U.S. Gulf of Mexico and the communities that rely on them. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, Ari Daniel, Christine Gentry, and Skylar Bear. The podcast is produced by Rose Evelith. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lana Groger, and Justin D'Ambrugio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to the Koshland Museum for hosting and supporting the show, and to the Summer Solstice for... No, wait, it's over. Now things are getting dark. <sighs> thanks for listening. When we made our McDonald's spicy chicken McNuggets, you were praise hands emoji. Then we ran out, and you were streaming tears emoji. Now they're back, so you can be grinning face with sweat emoji. Order ahead on the McDonald's app. And get money mouth face emoji with two orders of crispy, irresistible 10-piece McNuggets, spicy or classic, for just $6. Limited time only. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba.